Swing Left Texas 32. My name is Carissa Cloward. I'm an associate professor of political science here at SMU. I'm also a member of the Blue Wall. Um, I will be serving as the moderator for this afternoon's forum. The race in District 32 is an exciting one. Though Republican Pete Sessions ran unopposed in 2016, Hillary Clinton actually defeated Donald Trump in the district that year. Uh, <laughs> The congressional race is looking very different as we have a crowded field of qualified candidates seeking the Democratic Party's nomination and looking to unseat Sessions in November. Um, <laughs> it is my pleasure now to introduce the five leading candidates for the Democratic Party's nomination in District 32. The following information was provided by the campaigns to the Forum Organizing Committee. Um, single mom, entrepreneur, and Obama sub-cabinet official from East Dallas, Lillian Salerno believes it's time we take back power. She will fight for health care, economic opportunity, and women's rights. <laughs> Colin Allred was raised by a single mother here in Texas 32. This community gave him the chance to succeed. Colin's story shouldn't be unique. He's running to ensure everyone has that same opportunity. <laughs> Brett Schiff is a former investigative reporter, born and raised in Dallas, with 22 years experience at Channel 8. He's running for Congress to, be, to bring sanity, civility, and accountability to Washington, D.C. George Rodriguez is here today as a lifelong District 32 resident who has made an impact on this community as a DISD and SMU graduate, business owner, and community servant. And a former senior advisor in the Obama administration and Dallas nonprofit executive, Ed Bryant Meyer is running because it's time North Texas had a representative who will stand up and put values into action. to explain the format and rules we will be following for the forum. Um, first, it's important to emphasize that this is indeed a forum and not a debate. Um, the goal is for you all to learn more about the policy views and qualifications of the candidates so that you can make an informed decision when voting in the Democratic primary. Um, the candidates should thus endeavor to distinguish themselves from one another on the basis of those qualifications and policy objectives, but should not engage in personal or negative attacks against the other candidates. Um, I'm sure that this will not be an issue as we have witnessed a high degree of civility and indeed collegiality amongst the candidates throughout the campaign. <laughs> as the moderator, I will pose a series of questions on the general topics of electability, independence, and the candidates' congressional plans, um, as well as on specific policy issues that we believe are important to voters in this district namely women's rights, immigration, jobs in the economy, health care, infrastructure, and gun safety. The candidates will each have 90 seconds to respond to the questions, um, and the response order has been randomized for each question. We have a timekeeper who will employ a light system so that the candidates are aware of how much time they've used, um, and I will stop the candidates if they exceed their time limit. As the moderator, I've also reserved the right um, to follow up with individual candidates based on their answers, and in such instances, the candidate in question will have 30 seconds to respond. To maximize the use of our time, we'd like to ask everyone to hold your applause until the end of the forum. Um, we would also like to ask you to silence your cell phones if you have not already done so. Everybody's suddenly reaching into their backs. Um, <laughs> If you would like to take photos through the forum, please also ensure you have turned off any flash. We encourage you to share your photos of the event on social media and to use the hashtag UnseatPete to share your photos of the event and to signify our collective. The forum is being live streamed at facebook.com backslash lena.web. That's L-E-N-N-A dot W-E-B-B. -B. Um, video of the event will also be available at a later date through the forum's Facebook page and via the Blue Wall's various web platforms. With that, let's begin. Um, so we have opted to forgo traditional opening statements from the candidates. 
Instead, in the spirit of uniting around the common goal of the The tech system is not a fan of common goals. Uh, in the spirit of uniting around the common goal of defeating Pete Sessions, regardless of who ultimately wins the Democratic primary, I'd like to ask the candidates to begin by describing something they admire about each of the other candidates here on the stage. And we'll begin with Fred Schiff. Well, that will be the easiest question that we're asked all day. Uh, I've been with my colleagues on the campaign trail here for about three months now, and each and every one of them brings their own skill set that is, uh, makes them not only unique, but makes them uniquely qualified to beat Pete Sessions. All of us, I believe, are qualified to beat Pete Sessions in November. All of us uh, come with the same uh, tenacious attitude. All of us come with the same hole in our heart. All of us come with the same sort of of uh, disgust and um, uh, of, with what's going on in this country. Um, Lillian brings the, the female perspective, which is sorely needed today in today's climate. George, his immigration background. Ed brings his experience uh, from Washington and his connections in Washington. Colin brings not only a, a hometown hero perspective, not only a professional perspective, but a legal perspective and one that is political. I think all of us have the same goal. All of us knows that what is going on in Congress, and in the White House right now, is not acceptable, and all of us are in a position and have the capability to change. So next will be Colin Albright. Well, thank you. I think this is, a, this is a great question to start with. Um, you know, this is my home. I was born and raised here in Texas 32, and I'm, uh, no matter how they've drawn it, I've always been within this district. Uh, <laughs> growing up, my member of Congress was Martin Frost until they drew him out of his district. And uh, I am confident that one of us is going to be beating Pete Sessions here in about less than nine months. Uh, and, and I'm really proud to be here with these, this group of candidates. Uh, every single one of them has tremendous qualities that they brought to this race. Uh, I think that uh, Brett's investigative reporting background is something that will be sorely needed on Capitol Hill to shine a light on dark places. I certainly know that Lillian is a fighter who's been fighting all of her life, and I think that that's something I admire about her. Uh, George, with his experience in one of the most important issues and his passion for that issue, uh, which is immigration, I think is something that we all I need to be listening to. Uh, and certainly Ed's experience and his heart for this district, I think is something that I love about him. And, you know, we have been very collegial throughout this campaign, and I think it's for good reason, uh, because we have five here, there are a couple others who have filed as well, uh, really good folks running. And I think that's a great thing for all of us, because no matter what happens in this race, my mom and my aunt and uncle who have been in this district for over 70 years are going to be constituents of uh, whoever wins this. And so I know that we have to do a good job, because uh, they deserve better than what they're getting right now. <laughs> Uh, please remember to hold your applause until the end of the forum. We really are going to lose a lot of time if we clap after everyone. Um, uh, next will be Ed Meyer. Thank you, and this is a great question. It's great to be here with you all today. Uh, you know, 10 months ago, I started this campaign for Congress, and one of the very first calls I made was actually to Colin, and because uh, I'd heard his name and he was thinking about running. This was probably like 12 months ago, I'm not sure, about a year ago. And we just had a wonderful conversation and really concluded saying, wow, we, we'd really be good friends, and we're going to be good friends at our. Uh, and it was just kind of a moment where uh, you realize that how wonderful it is that we've gone from having no one running against speed sessions to that moment knowing, all right, we're going to give Democrats a real choice in this election, and that's what's so important. So I think the world of Colin and his, his hometown roots and, and uh, just the generosity of the spirit. Uh, of course, George, sitting right here, probably has the best sense of humor of all of us up on the stage. Uh, always cracking a really uh, good joke, and obviously is, this knows more about immigration than uh, probably you know the rest of us, and is just a real, a real champion on that issue. Lily and I truly admire as a small business owner and, uh, and, and a woman that really is, has a wonderful fighting spirit. And, uh, and then Brett, as well, uh, fighting spirit, investigative reporter guy, uh, has taken on a lot of battles, and he's, he's ready to you know, fight as well. So it's just wonderful being up here with these colleagues, and we have had a very uh, productive, happy, every, everyone always wants us, no personal attacks when we go into these things. We're kind of like, well, we're just, we're talking about the issues, and it's great to be up here with these great colleagues. Next is Lillian Salerno. 
I like all of them. <laughs> and I really like George's wife because I've met her and his 13 year old daughter. Now, we, we, it's one of those things, with, uh, just like Ed said, when we get that question of um, how are you all going to do, we're all in. I mean, that question of if whoever comes out of this, we've all made a pack that we're gonna help somebody beat Pete Sessions. And that's what I think the audience needs to know that, and our voters needs to know is that this is the most important race of our lifetime. We've gotta take back the House of Representatives and you've got five people up here that are willing to do it for you. And what we all know is we respect each other because putting yourself out there and running for office is just a lot for you and your family. And so I, actually sat with Brett at a table the other night and uh, have a lot of uh, respect for his uh, sense of humor and his um, determination to make sure that, you know, right is right. I have a lot of respect for George because he's been in this community doing the hard work, being a mentor um, and being a women's advocate. And I have a lot of respect for that. And I know that Ed has served his country as an Obama appointee, as Colin and I also have, and I know what that takes, and I know how hard that is. And he has a beautiful family, and Colin is someone that I know probably most better than the rest of my colleagues here, because he and I share a friend that he and I both have a lot of respect for that was part of the Obama administration, and I feel a kindred spirit with him, and I'm out of time. <laughs> No, you know, being last is like the worst in that question, right? <laughs> uh, but, you know, it doesn't matter how strong we are and how great we are. It's really about you folks, all of you that are here in this room. And we're going to need you. And, and, you know, we greatly, all of us greatly appreciate all the people that have been showing up to this forums. Um, you know, Brett, I, I greatly admire your tenacity and the work that you've done, you know, as a reporter. Uh, I was, I, I wrote a note over to to Ed during one of the forums, and I said, man, we need to get a copy of his dictionary. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, Lillian, I gotta tell you from the very beginning, you know, Lillian's just one of the warmest people you could ever meet, you know, and she, I, you know, thanks to Lillian, we all hug, because, you know, Lillian's a hugger, right? And I'm a hugger too, so I appreciate that, you know? And, you know, it, it, in all the work that you've done in your career, you know, and, you know, being a single mom, and I, you know, that's rough, and, and I admire you for that, for your strength. And, you know, Ed, we're all smart, but, you know, Ed, you're probably the smartest guy up here, right? <laughs> you know, um, great guy, great family guys, done great work. Um, you know, Colin, man, you know, Good looking, tall, <laughs> smart, athlete, played in the NFL, you know. So you guys have some great choices, and, and thank God we, we have that, because we're going to need that. And we can beat Pete Sessions. Anybody up here, I think, can beat Pete Sessions. Thank you. All right, so a big question for many people is whether any Democrat can win in this district. For that to happen, it may require both an influx of new voters and a successful broadening of the Democratic coalition. I'd like to ask you about each of these challenges in turn. Um, first, if you secure the nomination, how do you plan to boost overall voter turnout in the general election, particularly during a midterm year? Relative to your primary opponents, do you believe that your campaign's ground game would be better positioned to get out the vote? And if so, why? Um, and this will go first to Ed Meyer. Thank you. This is the central question of this campaign. Who is going to be able to go up and beat Pete Sessions? And that's a decision that everyone in this room is going to need to make starting on Tuesday with early vote. And you need to decide which of these candidates, which of us up here, is going to be able to make sure that we're able to pull together the coalition necessary to beat Pete Sessions. So I was a precinct chair going back to 2006. And who all remembers what happened in 2006 in this county here in Dallas? We turned this thing from Republican to Democrat, and it was after some, some elections that happened in 2004 where Luke Valdez won sheriff and Denise Garcia and Lorraine Braggio, a few people broke through, there was hope, and we organized and we coordinated. 
That has to happen again right now in this district. There's going to be another blue wave election in Congressional District 32, and I'm prepared to work with the with Indivisible, with Swing Left, with the county party. I'm prepared to work with the coordinated campaigns for Senate and, and State House races as well to make sure that we're working together, sharing information, canvassing together, and we're getting out the vote. But you know what it's also going to take? It's going to take resources as well. And I've outraised Pete Sessions among individual donors since I've been in this race, and it's a disservice to suggest that that's not important in this race. He's going to have a ton of corporate PAC and special interest money pouring into this race, and we've got to make sure we have the resources necessary to get out there, communicate with voters, and have that coordinated campaign, get up on the airwaves as well as the ground game that's essential to winning this election, and I'm prepared to do that. Great. Uh, next is George Rutgers. George Rodriguez. Thank you. Um, you know what? We have to go back to November 2016. I remember the devastation in my wife's face when we saw what was going to, about to happen. And we can't walk away from that election thinking that the only lesson there is about the Russians and Trump's, uh, the Russians meddling in our elections. A lot of people feel that they haven't been listened to. That's why Bernie Sanders got as far as he did. That's why Donald Trump got elected. So I think it's going to take three things. Number one, we've got to listen. And I've been doing a lot of listening throughout the entire district. Number two, we have to engage all the diverse communities in our district. We have to reach out to everybody that is here, regardless of their, their background, regardless of their gender. We've got to reach out to the independents, and we've got to reach out to the soft Republicans as well. And finally, we've got to realize, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but this district is not just the M Streets and Preston Hollow. It's Richardson, it's Garland, it's Wiley in all of those districts. Pete Sessions, if you want to get a chuckle, Pete Sessions, look at his website. He says that 46% of this district is Latino. Look at his door hangers, look at the pictures. They understand what's going on in this district and the changes that are coming about. So what we need is somebody who's able to bring in all of these communities and are able to get people out and vote. That's what it's going to take to beat Pete Sessions. Next up is Lillian Salerno. I've thought about this a lot. I thought about it before I got into the race. In order to win this race, because it's such deeply gerrymandered, you have to have the candidate that resonates the value of the district, and you have to have someone who'll excite the base, and then you have to have someone who will motivate those Republicans and independents to cross over. I worked here in 2008 when Obama uh, was here in March, and those of us that were involved with the Obama campaign, we saw people really come out. That's not going to happen in 2000, in a mid, mid, midterm. We hope some of it happens, and we have a lot of people getting involved, and we have such great organizations here in the 32nd District that are doing the hard work of registering voters and educating voters. That's one piece. Exciting our base is one piece, but if we, we must have a candidate that allows moderates, Republicans and independents to cross over. And those of us that are women, we wake up every day with a, a guy in the White House that offends us. So do, so do Republican and independent women. They're volunteering for our campaign, they're donating to our campaign, they don't have a party. And they know that we haven't elected a new woman to Congress for 22 years from Texas. And I think this will allow them a place to come over. And if we don't have them, we can't win this district. OK, next is Colin Allred. Well, thank you. This is, I think, the question for us. Uh, most of my civil rights career as an attorney has been spent in the area of voting rights. And in 2014, I was the Dallas-Fort Worth voting rights director for the Wendy Davis campaign. And I can tell you that our issue in Texas and our issue in, De in Dallas and in North Texas here is that we don't have enough folks voting. Did not vote would have won all of our elections, right? Our issue is not that we're a red state or that we're a red district, it's that we're a non-voting state and we're a non-voting district. And in a region like this, we have to go to our voters and turn them out. And our campaign, and, and this, my colleagues are probably getting tired of hearing me say this, we've knocked on 18,000 doors now, 18,000 doors. We had 75 folks knocking doors yesterday. We have hundreds of volunteers. We've made over 10,000 phone calls. We're taking this campaign to the voters because that's what it takes. That's, gonna, that's what it's gonna take to win this seat. And I think it's incumbent upon us not only to win this seat, but to win the state house seats that are in it. 
and when the state senate seats that are in it, to help Beto win at the senate level, to help whoever our gubernatorial candidates win. We have to get as many votes out of Dallas and out of North Texas as possible. And we have to learn the lesson of Alabama, the lesson of New Jersey, and the lesson of Virginia, which is that if a wave is coming, it's going to have to be a diverse wave. We're going to have to turn out a diverse electorate that looks like our community. And I think that's what we've been doing in my campaign. If you come to any of our events, you'll see that the folks who are with us look like this area, they look like this district, and that's the way we have to deliver our message. First of all, um, I think we all heard that uh, Ben is going to pledge all his great resources to helping us get out, get out the vote. Uh, I think that may be the most important thing that happens. All of us, we're going to help each other, but most importantly, I think we have the best motivating turnout factor uh, in the world in a president who is uh, unfit for office, a president who is a daily embarrassment to all of us, a president who is a threat to our democracy, a threat to um, so many civil rights, to women's rights, to the environment. That is the best motivating factor for turning out the vote. This number two motivating factor is Pete Sessions, who is nothing more than an acolyte of Donald Trump. We've looked at his voting record. We know that they are in lockstep with each other, so it'll be very easy to motivate the voters uh, in the Democratic Party and also the Republican Party, who are tired of Sessions. They're tired of Trump. Just this week, we found out that Trump that, uh, excuse me, Pete Sessions has received $158,000 from the NRA. And we also learned just today a quote from his website. It says, I am proud to have a career voting record score of A-plus from the NRA, the highest possible rating for a member of Congress. Mr. Sessions, I have a quote for you. It's from Edmund Burke. It says, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing and women, and we have five and seven in this race of good men and women who are doing something and will fight back and will win in November. Uh, now to the second part of the question. There has been an ongoing debate within the Democratic Party about whether to try to win by focusing energy on generating enthusiasm within the Democratic base or by reaching out to moderates and independents. How would you describe your campaign strategy with respect to this debate, and what are your plans for executing this strategy? Relative to your primary opponents, do you believe that your message and platform could better attract a winning coalition of general election voters? And if so, why? Um, and this goes first to Colin Allred. Well, I think this is a, it's an important question. Uh, it is, but I think that we have to do both. We have to grow the pie, and we also have to provide uh, a landing place for folks who have been left behind by the Republican Party. I know a lot of folks who come to my events or have been involved in our campaign who were Republicans who maybe uh, don't recognize the party that it's become. It's certainly not the party of George W. Bush. George H. W. Bush would never get elected in this party uh, where it's gone to now. And so I think we have to provide that safe landing space. Uh, but also, I was on the Wendy Davis campaign. Although I was on the voting rights side, I wasn't involved in the political decisions. Uh, I saw what happened there. The plan was to get as many Republican women as possible uh, to vote for her so that we could eke out that 51% victory. And it didn't happen. And it didn't happen in the numbers that, were, that we were relying on. And in large part because of the issue of choice. I think all of us up here are pro-choice, and I think there are many Republican women who are not going to cross over to, for, to go against Pete Sessions the way they would maybe to go against Donald Trump. Uh, and so I think this is, we have to recognize that we're running against Pete Sessions and not running against Donald Trump. And we have to go out there and turn out a diverse electorate like I said, this is a, a non-voting district. We're 49th or 51st, whatever it is in the country in voting. And the folks who are not voting at a higher rate in this area are our voters. And that's who we need to be going to, that's who we need to be growing the pie with, and that's how we're going to win in this seat, in the seats underneath it, and the seats that are above it. Next is Ed Meyer. So we certainly have to grow the base. This is going to take, and we have to win the crossover voters. It definitely takes both to beat Pete Sessions. Growing the base is critical. We've got to register more voters. We've got to motivate folks to get out and vote in a midterm election that we typically don't vote well in. We have to admit that as Democrats. We're not good at turning out in these midterm elections, and that's why we've got to make sure that we're listening and communicating, going door to door, and energizing people with a unifying message that is critical. But the reason that resources are important, the Koch brothers are going to pour $400 million into congressional races across this country. There's all kinds of special interest money that is going to be pouring in and super PAC money to help Pete Sessions keep his seat right now. 
And that money is going to be targeted at those moderate Republican voters to try to keep them to vote for Pete Sessions, even though that there are thousands of those people that, that are all across this district that are fed up with him being a rubber stamp for Donald Trump. Our job is to make sure that we are able to reach out and communicate with those crossover voters in addition to firing up our base and getting our base out, base out to vote. And that's what I'm committed to be able to do. That's where it takes both the ground game and the air game to make sure that we communicate. The unifying message in our grassroots campaign is critical in this election. But it, these close races are going to be won by candidates who are able to go up and communicate with those crossover voters through the airwaves because we're going to get bombarded by all the negative campaigning that's going to be funded by Pete Sessions' special interest buddies. I guarantee you that. And we've got to be able to fight back. And I have the proven ability to be able to do that. Next is George R. Lucas. OK. <clears throat> you know, I, I think this is an important question. Because starting Tuesday, running all the way to March 6, you're going to have to decide whether this is going to be an election about a litmus test as to who has the most deepest connections to the party and to the establishment, or who's the best Democrat to beat Pete Sessions. And I want you to think about that. Now, I have my democratic values, and I'll fight for my democratic values. And you'll see that many of us have very similar views on the issues. But I think it's important that when we knock on those doors, that we are personally knocking on doors and reaching out to people. And not just talking to the Democrats, but talking to the Republicans. You know, I'm a Texan. I wear boots. I drive a pickup truck. I'm a hunter. But you know what? The safety of our children is a purple issue. Immigration is a purple issue. Underemployment is a purple issue. It's not a red issue, and it's not a blue issue. And we need to talk to people. There are Republicans with common sense. As a matter of fact, a lot of Republicans have fallen out of their party because it's gone too far out to the right, just like there's a lot of Democrats who have fallen out because we've gotten a little too far out to the left. We've got to concentrate on those people who are in the middle and work our way out. And that's how we're going to beat Pete Sessions. Next is Brett Schiff. Well, I would answer very easily by saying I uh, grew up in this town. I grew up actually a few blocks from SMU. In fact, I terrorized this campus for much of my young life. Uh, I, I am familiar with Dallas. I have uh, born and raised here, worked here for 25 years. And in that 25 years, I have done stories not based on whether you're a Democrat or not whether you're a Republican, but whether you were right or whether you were wrong. And every Republican in this town knows my reputation for integrity and for courage and for the ability to stand up to the powers that be, including Democrats. There's only one person in this town who had the temerity to stand up to John Wilder Price over and again because of the evidence that I had collected on the way he conducted himself as one of the most powerful politicians in this city. I've also stood up to Jerry Jones. I've stood up to the Chamber of Commerce. I've stood up to DISD superintendents. I've stood up to the governor. I have stood up to the Railroad Commission. I have made changes in sector after sector of our community, and I have helped right wrongs. And I think the Republicans who have, I, I've talked to, very many of them, they've held fundraisers for me. They want change, too. They know I'm a Democrat. They know I've called for Trump's impeachment, but they don't care. They want somebody with integrity, and they want someone with civility and ability, and that is the person I am. And last to Lily. When I knock on doors, what I hear is Pete Sessions is completely aligned with Donald Trump. I'm knocking on Democratic doors because I'm in a Democratic primary. But what I also hear, because I went to law school here, my family's here, lots of my family are Republicans, they don't have a party. And what we know, just as common sense people, 80% of us are a lot alike, Republicans, Democrats. There's only, on either end, there's folks that make it so we bend one way or the other. What we have to do in order to win this seat is we have to have crossover. And I worked for Mayor Bill White when he ran for governor here. And I saw we did event after event where Republicans and independents, business people, 
would be in houses across this district and listen to him. He was a businessman. He was here. That's who I am. I'm here. There's nothing somebody can give me that's going to make me go there or there. And people know that about me. And because I grew up with eight brothers and sisters, all I know is fight and compromise. And that's what this district wants. <laughs> they want someone who fights and compromise because people want to move the country forward. So they need a fighter, but somebody who's had a full life experience and knows our children come first. Our faith communities are important. Working people are important, and we got to move this country forward. Okay, are there any specific policy issues where you would break with the Democratic Party establishment, either due to your own deeply held beliefs or to your understanding of the needs and interests of District 32's residents? And this will go first to George Rodriguez. I have to think about that a little bit, but I think one of the issues that, that comes to mind immediately uh, is my view on health care. Uh, a couple of things about health care. Number one, I believe that the Affordable Care Act is our best solution right now. And I know that a lot of Democrats talk about single payer and Medicare for all. And I don't have an actual issue with that. The problem that I have is we can't just flip the switch right now and switch over to Medicare like that. There's no coverage for pediatrics. There's no coverage for OBGYNs. I had my parents, they passed away two and three years ago. And I had to deal with the Medicare website. It's a disaster. I couldn't figure out. I've got two degrees. My wife's got two degrees. She couldn't figure it out. So we've got to get the technology up to date. We're about five to ten years behind before we could ever even look at Medicare for all or single payer. Because that's it, it, what we don't want is to adopt a program and have the Republicans come back and go, see, you guys were wrong. ACA is budget neutral. The taxes are already built in. We just need to add two more levels to help that middle, middle class with the premiums. That's what it's going to take. We got to 91%. Universal health care is when we get to 97, 98%. Under the Trump administration, it's probably going to fall down to 89, maybe 88%. But we need to save that. Our country deserves that. This goes next to Brett Shipp. I don't really foresee any issues right now. I know we have uh, disagreed on one main issue among us in various forums and formats in the past few days, and that's the spending bill. Uh, I think all of my colleagues up here were in favor of holding up the spending bill to, to help out the, the dreamers, which I fully believe in. I think there is a, a, a clean bill solution to the DACA situation, but I did not believe in compromising uh, the operations of the government over a position which really had no leverage and had no end game. And I believe that many of the Democrats were wrong in uh, voting to hold up spending for the federal government. I think that, that keeping this gov government running and efficient is very important, but I also believe that there is a way to independently achieve, and we will independently achieve, uh, protection for 1.8 million dreamers and it will come. If not now, it will come when I get to Congress. I would also differ with any Democrat in Congress if what their conduct is is detrimental to any citizens or a majority of citizens of, of District 32. They come first, This uh, North Texas comes second, Texas comes third, and uh, I will make sure that my constituents are protected, and I will not go along with the Democratic Party if there is a threat to, to my constituents. Next is Ed Meyer. So this is one of the biggest issues I've heard on this campaign. I've, I've listened to folks all across this district, and they want someone who's got progressive values, who believes in fairness, opportunity, treating people with dignity and respect. And that's what my campaign is all about. But they also want someone who's going to be a problem solver. And I've heard from folks all across this district that they don't want someone that's just going to go and be a rubber stamp for the Democratic Party, the Democratic leadership. But they want a candidate who, when it comes down to issues and votes, they're willing to actually be a problem solver, figure out what's right for this community in North Texas, and stand for those values and figure out how to get solutions done. Right now, in our congressperson, we've got someone who's a rubber stamp for Donald Trump. And folks in this district all across North Texas are saying, enough of that. And what I understand, the way I approach problems, when I was a senior advisor at the State Department, my role was to manage the transition out of Iraq to make sure our diplomats and aid workers were safe and secure. 
And whether I was in the White House Situation Room, up in Congress working and negotiating with Republicans and Democrats on how to fund and, and transition out of Iraq, or if I was in country working with the Pentagon and soldiers over there, all that mattered was that we accomplished the mission. There wasn't a Democratic position or a Republican position, and that's the approach I would bring to Washington, and I would be happy to break, if, if there was an issue I need to break with Democratic leadership to represent the values of this district, I would be happy to do that. So I'm going to exercise my moderate prerogative here and say that the question asked um, whether there were any specific policy issues where at this point you would be willing to say you'd break with the party either because of your own closely held beliefs or because of your understanding of the needs of the, of the residents of the district. So at this point, you know, I, you'd have to look at what, what the broad, uh, you know, I, I don't know if there is like a single issue that the leadership is pushing right now necessarily that would be something that I would break from at this exact moment. And so you'd have to kind of look at specific issues as they come up when I would be in Congress. All right, and next is Lillian Swearer. Money and politics. That's what, you know, my whole career that's been so awful about being in the kind of positions that I've been trying to get things done in Washington in my career as an Obama official and before that, when I was working on affordable health care. There was this idea that, you know, everybody's going to play in the same sandbox, but that's not, you, you don't have an equal footing if you're taking millions of dollars from Wall Street or pharma or big medicine middlemen. So, for example, when we were trying to pass the Affordable Care Act, we wanted single payer. Most of this country wanted single payer then. But the Democratic Party went in there and scared the White House and wouldn't do the hard work of taking the fight then and came to the pharmaceutical industry. And we've all been paying for it ever since. And that's about money and politics. And I am completely on the other side of the Central Democratic Party when they think it's okay to take big Wall Street money and then not put them in jail. Somebody should have gone to jail. Last call on well, first of all, the uh, Democratic leadership that agreed to this uh, must-pass uh, funding bill, I, in my opinion, I completely disagree with what they did. They traded some domestic discretionary spending uh, for dealing with the DREAM Act and dealing with DREAMers down the road, and I think that was the exactly wrong thing. I would have stood on my desk until we took care of the DREAMers. We had the leverage. They needed our votes to pass that bill. Otherwise, the government wouldn't stay open because they couldn't agree on their side. And we still came over and voted for this must-pass spending bill without getting what we really wanted and what we need. If you're wondering where the vote is, if you're wondering where the black vote is or where the Latino vote is, then stand up for us when we need it. Stand up when you're in Congress. Stand up when it's your time, you have a moment. We should be passing the DREAM Act. These kids are our kids, they need to stay here. And I certainly would have broken with the Democratic leadership on that. Uh, on education, I think that we need to end their high stakes testing, which Democrats have contributed to uh, in large measure. We need to go back to teaching vocational training in our high schools. The ISD is already doing some of this. We need to invest more in that. We have a shortage of skilled labor in this area. We need to be giving our kids the skills they need to get into the jobs they need right now. Focusing more on computer science and coding and plumbing and pipetting, all the things that you can't out offshore, you can't automate, and have to be done right here. The Democratic Party has been wrong, in my opinion, to put too much focus on testing, although there are some, certainly we need tests. Uh, and finally, I would just say the Russia thing. I know we all are upset about the Russia thing. I know we are. It's a huge deal, and it, it needs to be investigated and seen through. But we as Democrats need to talk about what people are dealing with when they sit down at their kitchen table at night, and that's what, how we're getting people out the vote. Okay. Um, freshman Congress people often have a limited role in setting overall party or legislative agendas, but there is nonetheless some scope for them to take initiative. If elected to Congress, are there any specific bills you already have in mind that you intend to introduce? And are there any specific congressional committees you hope to join? And this will go first to Lillian Salerno. Yes. Um, I've been working on healthcare transparency for about 20 years and what needs to happen to do any of the great things we want to do with affordable health care and quality health care is get the cost down. And we've been trying to have hearings for a long time to figure out why the average consumer can't know what their stint's going to cost or what their child, when they take them in for a broken arm, whether it's going to cost 2000 20000 or 40000 depending on which insurance policy they have. This makes it hard on healthcare practitioners, so what we have to do is we have to bring in not just lawyers like me, 
but engineers and people that know what things cost to make, and we need to have a hearing on costs and what true costs are, and the new consumer protection so consumers are entitled to that cost. So that would be on the health care committee. That's the um, kind of legislation is a consumer rights on costs for health care. Uh, this goes next to George Rodriguez. Sorry, I keep trying to get the habit to turn it off. Um, <clears throat> workforce development. I think that's the, one of the most important things that we need to address in Congress. And one of the things I would like to do when I get to Congress, I'd like to reach out to Congressman D.C., Congressman Johnson, and I think it would be great to unite our city in one town hall meeting where we can all come together, probably in central part of Dallas, so that we bring the entire city together. I'd also like to pledge to have town hall meetings at least four to six times uh, throughout the year. All that aside, workforce development, we've got to go back and we've got to fund the, the Quest Skills program, which makes a bridge between education and the employer. That is so important in this country. Cyber terrorism is a huge problem. Look at the Russian meddling in our elections. This is jeopardizing our democracy, our families, our economy. Let's get folks into vocational programs so that they can learn how to deal with these hackers. Let's, let's work and give companies an incentive. Let's invest in our workers. Let's give them an incentive to provide uh, retraining. Give, give them some, some kind of tax break for that, not just for being wealthy. Let's also give an incentive to corporations to pay off student loans for their employees, tax-free to the employer and the employee. And part of the education that we need to have when we tie education into work is that let's give these kids a break. Let's put a cap on student loans at 3% on the interest rates so they can actually pay those loans. So I think workforce development, especially with the economy that's coming in the next year, is going to be vitally important to our country. Uh, this next goes to Colin Allred. Well, all of the issues that we want to do, whether it's education or health care, rely on us getting folks elected and be allowing us to get folks elected who will fight for them. And so in Congress, the first thing I want to do is three things that deal with voting. Uh, because we can't get by in this country anymore with less than 50% voter turnout. So the first thing is to restore the Voting Rights Act. Uh, we lost that uh, with the uh, decision the Supreme Court made. It was a horrible loss for us. I've been part of litigation that is still ongoing and that will be ongoing, and that has had elections happening in the meantime that, in my opinion, have elected illegitimate people because they were elected under laws that were discriminatory. Uh, the second thing is automatic voter registration. Uh, when you turn 18, you should be automatically registered to vote. When I turned 18, I was automatically registered for the selective service so I could be drafted by the military if need be. Uh, we can do this. We just have decided not to. And the last thing is I would make Election Day a national holiday. I can just swap Columbus Day, in my opinion. Uh, and uh, because for too many of our folks are having to choose between going to work and voting. We need to make Election Day a national holiday, just remove that entirely from the issue. Uh, finally, what kind of what committee would I serve on? Uh, the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee is one of the most powerful committees. Uh, when I was in the White House working in the Office of White House Counsel, we had to deal with them a lot when the Republicans took over the House. Uh, and at HUD, uh, we had to deal with them as well. They provide, they are supposed to provide oversight of the administration into everything that they're doing, make sure they're using your money in the right way, making sure they're not undermining the mission of their agency. Uh, that committee is not doing it right now, obviously, and when we take the House back, I would want to be on that committee and I want to find out what they're doing and stop them from doing it. This goes next to Brett Ship. Is there a gun regulation, a gun control committee? I'd like to be on that. Well, there is not. Um, <laughs> I, I um, you know, health care and immigrant rights and women's rights and, and, and the environment, I want to be on all those committees, but right now I'm so myopic. I'm so disgusted with what's going on in this country. One of the reasons I quit my job, I was, in, I was on the fence and then Las Vegas happened. And Congress did exactly nothing. And then Sutherland Springs happened and Congress did exactly nothing. And now this, and Congress is probably not going to do anything until one of us gets up there and we turn turn the tide and, and we take control and responsible human beings marshal in sensible gun control. I say sensible, I'm changing my mind fast. I wanted, I read about Connecticut this morning. They've got a ban on assault rifles. They've got a ban on sale of magazines of 10 or greater. My position right now is magazines of 30 or more have to go. Body armor has to go. Universal background checks has to be implemented. We have to do something. 
before this happens again, but sadly it will happen again. But please put me on that committee. And lastly, Ted Meyer. So I am very passionate about leveling the playing field in education in this country. And that ties in with education and workforce. I served as, a, as an executive at Big Thought, an education nonprofit here in Dallas that works with over 100,000 kids to level the playing field. If you go to our schools and you see what happens in after school and summer learning, you just have to take a look at the, dis, the, the great disparity between those that have resources to put their kids into summer learning programs and those that don't have high quality uh, learning environments outside of school time. I would be in the Workforce and Education Committee on Congress, and I would work hard to do a few things. First of all, in the education K-12, we've got to invest in our teachers here in this country, and we've got to make sure we're paying them like the professionals that they are, and I would fight for that first and foremost so that we have an increasingly strong teacher pipeline and we treat them like the professionals they are. Number two is we have to build good pipelines from community colleges and colleges and, and from high schools to the workforce through apprenticeship programs. We need to double our apprenticeship programs for on-the-job training, and then once people are actually in these jobs, we need to incentivize businesses to invest more in their employees for professional development. And this is an area, this is from, from, from uh, K through 12 all the way through the workforce. We've got to be doubling down on our investments because the future of work is very uncertain in this country with growing automation and artificial intelligence. And we've got to be smart in investing in workforce now in our education now, but also with a lens to what's going to happen 10 years from now. And Congress has not taken that foresight to look to the future, and I would do that. Okay, now we're going to turn the conversation to some substantive policy questions. Uh, women face numerous challenges in the workplace. The Me Too and Time's Up movements have recently shown a light on the widespread problem of sexual harassment, including in Congress. In addition, women face other forms of workplace discrimination, and women working full-time in the U.S. continue to, to be paid only about 80% of what men are paid. Working mothers face further challenges related to inadequate maternity leave and unaffordable childcare. What specific legislative actions do you think would help women achieve more economic parity and provide them greater protections and support in the workplace? And this will go first to Brett Schiff. Honestly, I, I don't know what I would specifically propose. I mean, I, I, I would absolutely do something. I understand um, the, the, the disparity between pay and, and women and minorities and everybody deserves equal pay for, for equal work. Yes, I would fight for that. Um, well, the first thing I would do was fight to, to end this climate of, of harassment and abuse, and I would work on legislation that is being proposed right now to, to, to um, make sensible the process by now by which women uh, have to go through a three-month three -month process right now to file a sexual harassment claim. They have to go through mediation for a month, and they have to go through counseling for a month, and then they have to uh, agree to certain other parameters for a month before they can even file a suit. And, and then when it happens and, 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 a, and a man is found guilty, he's you know, from Congress, you know, he gets another fund to pay for it uh, out of taxpayer money. This is, this is, this is wrong. This is immoral. And, and I would fight to, to, um, for, for the law that is being proposed right now um, to change that and, and allow women to, to remain anonymous in filing of their complaints. But the sexual harassment, despicable conditions that exist even in the White House today have to be addressed and have to be fixed. This goes next to Ed Meyer. So a lot of folks start this question and answer a question like this saying, I have a mother, I have a wife, I have a sister, I have a daughter, I have all those. But that doesn't mean that you, if, even if you don't have an important woman in your life, that you shouldn't stand up for what is right and know what is wrong. And, and that is what I'm going to stand up for in Congress. And there's a few things, specifically when it comes to harassment, and you've got to make sure that we have support for survivors. And we've got to make sure that we have a fair process and that we have prevention programs. And we're investing in prevention programs in the workforce and in school. When it comes to women in the economy, an economy that unfairly burdens women is, not, is an economy that's not living up to its full potential. So I'm going to fight for the Paycheck Fairness Act to make sure that we have equal pay for equal work in this country. And when it comes to paid family leave, we've got to have paid family leave because there are too many people that are having to make choices between staying in the workforce and, 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 and having a family. People should never have to make that decision. 
And then affordable child care, that ties in directly with that. There are so many families, 42,000 people, middle skill jobs go unfilled in the DFW area. And one of the number one reasons is because those folks cannot get affordable child care. And all too often, it is women who are staying home with the kids because they don't have affordable child care. The government needs to increase subsidies and tax credits specifically so that we can make sure that people can fill those middle skill jobs and have high quality affordable child care. These are issues I'm going to fight for in Congress. And uh, thank you. This goes next to Lillian Soler. There's a couple of things. One is there's currently a piece of legislation by uh, Kristen Gillibrand and uh, Rosa DeLauro talking about just this, that this idea of um, paid family leave for both you know, the man and the woman and this idea that um, we as a first world country have some of the most backward policies in the developed world, how we treat our families and our children. I mean, it's uh, directly relevant from my, where I sit and my experience in Washington is, is about power. You get more people in this committee rooms that look like the folks working, you'll get different decisions. And this is another reason why we have to have more fair representation. We gotta have the people in those committee rooms haven't been the mother that took their kid to the doctor. You've gotta be, be the mother who couldn't take her kid, like me, to the doctor and sent her to school with strep throat when she was 10, because I couldn't get off work. You get those kind of people in the committee rooms, you'll get different decisions. And on the sexual harassment piece, that's again all about power. And the folks that are in those committee rooms, there are only 20% of them that are women. And you'll get different decisions. We've just got to change the makeup of the folks up there so they look at the families in a different way, sort of like moms look at families. This goes next to George Rodriguez. Thank you. I left my green light on this time. Um, there's a lot of things that we need to do. As a matter of fact, my wife and I were shared partners, not only in life, but also in business. And the reason that we went into business uh, by ourselves is because we wanted to have a family environment, and we wanted to be able to have a family ourselves. So this is very important to me. Uh, the majority of the, of the people that work at our office are working moms. So number one, yes, we need equal pay for equal work. You know what? We need to require that every federal contractor disclose salaries. Otherwise, we're just hypocrites. Uh, the other thing we need to do is paid family leave. We need to restore safety for young men and young women who may be subjected to sexual assault on university campuses. Uh, we need early learning programs, not just to help the working moms, but this helps kids who don't have the resources, poor kids who live in poverty, to get to the level where they can actually have the same type of, of, of level when they get to kindergarten with kids who have books at home, who can afford to have folks at home and read to them. But this is the most important thing we need to do. We need to have a commission to study what's been happening in sexual harassment in this country. We need to go back to the EEOC, and we need to redefine what sexual harassment means, because the last time we did that was in the 80s. We didn't even have social media. We didn't have the cell phones that we have today. So that's how we're going to protect women. We've got to get real. We've got to get back to governance. That means going in there, investigating, having experts come in, having testimony, and working on this issue, not just talking about it. This goes last to Colin Orange. Well, we're running against someone who voted against the Violence Against Women Act, who voted against the Lilly Ledbetter Act, who has voted against equal pay for equal work. Uh, every single time, Pete Sessions has been on the wrong side of these issues. And we need to begin in Congress by cleaning up Congress's house. There are dozens of sexual harassment settlements that have been paid out with uh, taxpayer money, apparently, uh, that we need to know more about what happened there. And we certainly need to reform that process and I would support that legislation. Uh, I certainly also think that we need to go back to teaching consent in our schools and teaching what that means. Uh, we, need, we have to start at a young age and kind of address the toxic masculinity that in many ways has seeped into the violence that we saw last week. Uh, and some of the violence that we've seen across the country has been driven by something that's deeper, uh, that's, it, it runs deeply in our culture that we need to try to root it out as much as possible. Uh, equal pay for equal work and paid family leave are certainly policies that we all agree on. Uh, but so is universal pre-K. We have to have universal pre-K. My mom took me uh, to pre-K one time when I had chicken pox, and I asked her why she did that, and she told me it was because she didn't have anywhere else to take me. Pre-K is crucial for the kids. We get a dollar, every dollar we invest in pre-K, we get eight dollars back, but it's also crucial for the families. Uh, disproportionately, women and women of color are, are, are earning the minimum wage, so we need to raise the minimum wage to make sure it's a living wage. 
uh, and reproductive rights. I will stand and support Planned Parenthood. I will stop the attacks on it, and I will make sure that uh, women have the right to choose and the right to choose what they will do with their bodies. So on that topic, women's reproductive rights have once again come under attack in the current Congress. From new rules granting permission to any employer to opt out of providing birth control coverage to the 20-week abortion ban that passed the House in October. In your view, what are the most pressing and significant policy issues with respect to women's reproductive health? Are there any legislative safeguards that could be put in place to defend women's reproductive rights from being further undermined? And this will go first to Ed Meyer. So I stand strong with Planned Parenthood. I visited a women's health clinic, actually. I found out that 10% of the patients that they see at this health clinic are actually men, 90% are women. And one of the most critical pieces that, that you, you learn is that Title X funding, funding for these for Planned Parenthood is so critical so that women of all economic income levels are able to access reproductive health decisions. This is absolutely critical. I would, and, and under the Trump budget and the budgets we've seen coming out of the Republican Congress, they are gutting that funding and it creates unequal health care options for women all across this country. So first and foremost, we have to defend a woman's right to choose. We have to defend a woman's right to make her own health decisions, reproductive health decisions. But, but importantly as well, is it goes beyond that and it comes down to community health centers like Planned Parenthood that provide this needed care for women. Otherwise, we're going to end up in a situation in our country where there's two different health care systems. We already have a situation with two different health care uh, 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 two different healthcare options. But we've got to make sure that women are not left behind and we must continue funding Title X and, and continue funding Planned Parenthood and community health centers. And that would be a top priority. This goes next to George Rodriguez. I fully agree that we need to protect women's reproduction rights. This is a decision between a, a woman, her doctor, and her family. The government has absolutely no place in making a decision for a woman or trying to control a woman's body. I think one of the things that we could do is sort of like we're trying to attempt with the uh, Voter Rights Advancement Act of 2017. Let's require a pre-clearance whenever a state legislature passes a law that may affect women's rights to, to, to an abortion or a reproduction rights. Uh, let's, let's, let's fund these community clinics, including Planned Parenthood. You know, we have got to address, especially in this state, the mater maternity mortality rate that is going on. And that's because women aren't getting the care that they need. We've got women who are dying giving birth because they've got high blood pressure, because they've got diabetes. This is in our own backyard. We can't allow this to happen in our country. So I do believe that we need to protect women's reproductive rights. And I think it's important, especially when you consider the majority of women, the majority of people who are in poverty are single moms. This goes next to Brett Schiff. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I would, I would fight uh, very diligently uh, and perpetually for, uh, to protect women's reprodu reproductive rights, their right to choose. Uh, Planned Parenthood, the, the, you know, the, these clinics are under constant assault, especially in this state, and I would just fight to um, raise awareness and any, at any turn uh, fight to protect um, community health centers and community clinics uh, where women are, are being treated and where children are being treated. But most, most horrifically, uh, I would fight against uh, the president's uh, policies and the president's budget to, to cut uh, 1.8 trillion dollars from social services which include many of of these services for women and children uh, I think it's abhorrent I think it's in war uh, he has proposed a 4.4 trillion dollar budget which not only blows up the deficit but um, it, it adds seven trillion dollars uh, to the deficit over the next 10 years um, add that to the 1.5 trillion dollar corporate, uh, you know, wet kiss that was given by Congress uh, in the form of tax breaks uh, a few weeks ago, uh, at the expense of 1.3 trillion dollars in cuts to social services. Um, I would fight to restore those, and that would be a, a major priority for me. This goes next to Colin. Well, the Trump administration uh, fairly quietly last year 
repeal an Obama rule, Obama era rule that uh, prevented your boss from deciding whether or not you should have access to birth control. Um, and my mom and I were talking about it, and she was telling me that she was burning her bra in the 60s and thought that we had, you know, in, in Austin, and she thought we had fought this fight <laughs> and that we had moved on. And she could not believe that we were still talking about access to birth control. And the idea that your boss should have some kind of say, or some kind of, that your company really should have some kind of say and some kind of religious belief whether or not you should have access to birth control. I mean, to me, that this is un untenable. And it was a regulation, but it can be undone, undone by legislation. And that's something I think we need to do in this next Congress. Uh, certainly, we need to provide Planned Parenthood with the Title X funding that they deserve. Really, when you talk about defunding Planned Parenthood, you're talking about discriminating against Planned Parenthood. Because all you're talking about is not reimbursing them for what they're already doing. And it's providing critical services. 95% of what they do, as we, many of us know, has nothing to do with choice. Uh, and it's, it provides critical services to men and women. Uh, and so it's, a, it's something we really need to be investing in. And finally, I just want to say we need to stand up to the rhetoric on this issue and stand up to the, the way it's talked about. There are policy things that we certainly need to be passing and doing, but we need to stand up to the way that they've been lying about so many of these issues and lying about choice and lying about uh, what this really means because it's really about economic freedom and a woman's right to choose what she's going to do with her life and how she's going to plan out and chart out her life. And that's something that I think we need to talk about more up front. All right, and last, well, I was that 37-year-old woman that was found herself pregnant, unintended. And I was so scared, but I was a lawyer. I had economic resources. I had a supportive family. So I got to make the decision to go ahead and have my son. And every woman should have the right to make that decision. The fact that we've allowed for so long a committee room full of only men in Washington, D.C., in Austin, Texas, tell us how to do our lives and our health care. Women should have the exclusive right to their health care, their families, with their doctors and their families. And it shouldn't be based that you don't get reproductive care because you have a different zip code. And this idea of what we've done with the defunding of Planned Parenthood, we're seeing these disastrous results of increased abortions, increased maternal mortality. People shouldn't be in the room deciding our fate without us in the room. This is about power. This is about representation. And until we get more women in the room, it's not going to change. In recent months, President Trump's revised travel ban has gone into effect. DACA has been rescinded, and temporary protected status has been revoked for hundreds of thousands of Salvadorans, Nicaraguans, and Haitians. Given that there are over 1.2 million immigrants living in the DFW metro area, these policy changes will undoubtedly have significant consequences for many District 32 residents. As Congress continues to struggle over the parameters of immigration reform legislation in light of Trump's executive actions, what do you see as the components of an acceptable compromise bill that could gain the support of both parties? And this will go first to Colin Allred. So it's an acceptable compromise on immigration specifically? Immigration reform, yes. Yeah. Well, this is something we're going to have to fight. This is why I think it was such a big mistake that we, we gave away our leverage on this issue. Uh, because we know that President Trump will tell us what he really thinks. Uh, one of the things that you have to almost uh, admire about him is that he will always say what he thinks. Uh, he will tweet that it, while his, his DOJ is in court arguing before the judges that this is not a travel ban. And he'll tweet, uphold the ban. <laughs> and then he'll be talking about legal immigration changes. And he'll be saying, well, I don't want to have uh, people from S-hole countries or if people from Nigeria come here, they won't go back to their huts. Or everybody from Haiti has AIDS. Uh, and so we know that their plans are based on a race-based view of the way things should be changed. They want to change our legal immigration system uh, in a way that I think will fundamentally alter who we are as people because it will be based on race in many ways. And I think we have to stand up to that. And so I don't think we can reach any agreement on that. But I think we have to reach an agreement and find a way to protect uh, the dreamers. Uh, and this is, to me, the number one issue the Democratic Party is facing because it's not just a policy issue, it's a moral issue. Uh, we as a party cannot allow a bunch of kids who are brought here as children to be sent back to countries that they don't know and that they don't have never been to. They are, in every way, other than documentation, Americans. They grew up here, they went to our schools, they served in our military, they are right now teaching in our schools. 
uh, and they deserve to have our protection. And we as Democrats need to put the full weight of our party and everything that we have behind finding a way to, if, if necessary, temporarily extend their protections, but certainly to, to get clean DREAM Act that gives them uh, access to legal status. This goes next to Lillian Salerno. The dreamers are as American as we are, and we must find a way to make sure they have an extension until we can figure out a way to have a clean dream act. I'm somebody that, you know, as uh, Sicilian immigrants that immigrated here uh, in the early 1900s, a bunch of them that helped build Dallas. And my family, they, we weren't allowed to use the word WAP because the, meant without papers, because that's what my grandfather, they called my grandfather and my, my father. But the fact that what we're doing today is about immigrants that are black and brown, this whitening of America, Donald Trump's vision, is so against every value that we have as Americans. And what we need to do, I'm for a full stop pathway to citizenship for those that are in this country that haven't broken the law and that are willing to pay taxes and if it's, are here because I don't believe in an America that's about scarcity. I believe in an America that's about inclusion, and we built this country on immigrants, and this idea that there's not enough, we're scapegoating. There's plenty. There's plenty here for all of us. And we need to work re with Republicans, and there was some good proposals over the last 10 years, and it's just about these parties being so unwilling to sit down and work things out and I think we just need some good folks up there that know how to fight and compromise. This goes next to Brett Schiff. <clears throat> this is um, one of the more confounding uh, issues that this country faces right now, but it's led by a president who has uh, the, the two people in his ear, one on one side, Steve Bannon, the other is Steve Miller, and these guys are running this country whispering uh, xenophobic, uh, bigoted phrases in the ear of the president. He's buying into it in his $25 million wall, which is nothing more than a metaphor for hate, and we know it. Everybody in this country knows it. There were six million people crossing illegally in this, the border in the country in the year 2000. Last year, there were 300,000 caught. That's it. There were 750,000 illegal immigrants came into this country last year. Where? Through our airports. Where's the fight over that? Here's what we're going to do. A few days ago, there were four different proposals to fix the DREAM Act. There were four proposals to, 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 to compromise. We were starting to make some, gain some ground and compromise in Washington. It was a maze, but who came along and stopped it? The president. He put an end to it. I would support one of those compromises, and here's why. And I know it includes a $25 million wall. Put me in Congress, and that wall will not be built. We'll take it back. I'm sorry. We'll take it back. This goes next to George Rodriguez. God, every time you say this goes to, I was hoping for me. I was every time with somebody else, I was like, darn! <laughs> I've spent 23 years as an immigration attorney fighting the Department of Homeland Security in, in the courtroom and fighting the Department of Homeland Security in conference rooms because of the policies they wanted to implement right here in our community. I would like to be the architect of our new immigration system. It needs to be revamped. It cannot be a race based system as this president would like that would take us back to the 1920s. The system we have now has quotas based in the 1970s. Bill Clinton allowed the Republicans to begin the criminalizing of immigration as part of a compromise in hopes that we would have another amnesty and we never did. So what we need to do is we need to stop deporting people because of a minor traffic infraction. We need to stop allowing the federal government to recategorize a misdemeanor into an aggravated felony and barring somebody for life and separating them from their family. There's a lot that we need to do, but, and I can go on and on, but I support the Herd Aguilar proposal where we would have DACA and the 1.8 million people get status and we would give funding for an, an investigation as to what we really need in terms of security, and I hope that it would also go towards cybersecurity in this country. 
So there is, there is a compromise here, but we're going to have to lay that bill on the president's desk and put that albatross around his neck and make him act. Your time's up. Um, and lastly, goes to Edward. So I was uh, born here in Dallas, Presbyterian Hospital. And when I was in elementary school at Walnut Hill Elementary, my parents moved to Nigeria. We served as, they served as medical missionaries there, working with uh, kids and families all across uh, Nigeria, teaching hospital. And my Nigerian friends, there was such a dream to come to the United States and become anything you wanted to become. Donald Trump's racist immigration views to cut people from Africa, Haiti, the S-hole country comment was one of the most offensive things I've heard. And the fact that he said we should open our doors to people from Norway, it is racist, it is bigoted, and it's ridiculous. It's just, it's just exactly what it is. We're the land of opportunity, and we need to remain that way. Dreamers, we've got to fight like crazy for dreamers in this country. This is an issue that 80% of Americans agree on. And it's a symbol of what's so dysfunctional about Washington right now. How, can we, how do we not already have a pathway to citizenship agreement on dreamers? We need a dream act by itself right now, a clean dream act to protect those uh, 1.8 folks, in, uh, uh, Americans in this country. Dreamers are as American as everybody in this room. And I would fight for that in Washington. And then finally, I would just say, that you know, there are measures that can be taken. We need to think about what security measures are. We're, I'm against the wall. We've got, to, we've got to focus on smart security measures, technology, and that's how we should be thinking about security. But we've got to pass the DREAM Act now, protect those Americans, and let them stay in our country. Thank you. Technological innovation has eliminated many manufacturing and other traditional blue collar jobs. What can Congress do to prepare the US workforce for the jobs of the present and future? And what would you do, if elected, to bring new quality jobs to the Dallas area? And this goes first to George Rodriguez. Workforce development, I mean, that's what we need. Uh, we need to be able to, to have these companies, you know, skilled labor, unskilled labor, provide retraining. We need to also look at attracting jobs, frankly, not the high tech, the high tech jobs in North Dallas are great. But we also need to get jobs down to the south side of town where people can get to work. The type of jobs that, that they can have, that, that they can actually perform in. We've got a huge issue with underemployment. And we have to be able to tie education into labor. That's what the problem is. They keep complaining that it's the immigrants who are taking away the jobs. We have very low unemployment right now. The problem that we really have is underemployment. And that's why we have an issue with poverty in this district. This goes next uh, to Colin Allred. Well, we have a skills gap in this area that we need to be addressing. Uh, if you are going to buy a new home in this area in North Texas, it's going to cost you $4,000 more than it would because we don't have enough plumbers and pipe fitters and carpenters, and so you're going to pay a premium for those folks. And a lot of them are aging out, and there's no generation of folks coming behind them. And these are good jobs. They can pay, in some cases, six figures. And I think we need to be exposing our kids to them. Exposing them, we need to bring back shop class, bring back metalworking class. Make sure that our kids have a chance to at least see what those horizons are and invest in apprenticeship programs uh, that will allow you to pair yourself with a master crafts person who can teach you how, this, how, how it works and how to become a great carpenter, become a great plumber or pipe fitter. You can't automate these jobs. You can't offshore them. And they're jobs that we need right here, right now, and they're available right now. Uh, we are not going to be able to end automation. It's, it's only going to accelerate, and it's only going to take away more jobs. So we need to be teaching our kids how to get involved in that by teaching coding and computer science along our side or other core courses. With English, math, science, all those courses of history, we should be adding in computer science because to interact with our 21st century economy, you're going to have to know how to interact with technology. And our kids need to be exposed to that. So we need to be teaching that and investing in that and making sure that they have access to that. And I think that's, that's our biggest task is to make sure that our kids are prepared for the 21st century and not for uh, the jobs of the last century. This goes next to Ed Meyer. So what happened in the coal communities in our country? We were not forward-looking enough. We were not preparing for what was going to happen to those coal miners and those communities when clean energy became more and more prevalent in our country. We need to start thinking about what's going to happen with increasing automation. It's already too, too late. We've got to accelerate that thinking about automation, artificial intelligence. What is the impact that's going to have on folks? Self-driving trucks aren't that far away in the future. 
And we're, what's going to happen to all of those truck drivers in terms of their jobs and their skills that they're going to need? We need to be investing right now. It starts with STEM education in our schools. We're not putting enough resources into STEM education. Every single kid should have computer science in this, in this country and in the K-12 space. Second, it's all about making linkages to apprenticeship programs and job training. And Dallas County Promise is a program right here in Dallas that's actually doing great work on that, where kids are getting to go to community college, they're getting linked up with mentors and on the job training. And I think that's a remarkable step that we're taking here in Dallas. And then finally, working with businesses to incentivize them to train their employees and make investments in their employees in those technology and middle skill jobs that we have to fill. We have six million middle skill jobs in this country that are unfilled because we have a skills gap. And we need to be making those smart investments, working with businesses to make sure we're investing not only in the now, but in the future so that we don't get flat foot, caught flat footed. This goes next to Lillian Salerno. I started a manufacturing company and that was about 22 years ago and we couldn't find anybody in this part of the country that could make sort of the most, we were doing automated assembly and we couldn't find anyone. And so we ended up having to go to Germany to buy a machine and then we brought it here and then eventually a bunch of Texans were able to, you know, after seeing it, being able to do anything. Texans are so good. Part of it's from our rich agricultural tradition where we know how to do stuff. And some of those tactile skills is, are what's missing. And so I'm all about STEM education, I'm all about coding, but we still need people that know how to actually work with their hands because it develops a part of the brain that you need for artificial intelligence. And what we know, and I sat on the White House Task Force on Manufacturing, is we need people actually that know how to <coughs> change oil. <laughs> we need somebody who knows how to work on a tractor before they go and, and know about coding. We need people with critical thinking skills. And I'm not somebody that thinks your taxpayers should have to pay for all of that. These companies, when they come in, they should have to train also because that's the way it used to be. And all these cities out trying to attract these businesses, we all want growth but they need to take responsibility also for training. Your tax dollars shouldn't have to spend for that. What we need is we need balance and we need our universities to be part of it and the companies themselves have to be part of the solution. We shouldn't be given give giveaways. And this goes last to Brescia. Uh, we need to, um, first of all, implement universal pre-K so we start getting all children prepared for school and eliminate or lower and, and reduce the achievement gap between the haves and the have-nots. The program Ed referred to is called PTEC. And there are 18 schools in DISD that are participants. It's a fascinating program. It's a blend of academics and workplace technology. It's junior, senior years, and they co-op with, with uh, community colleges, and they work together. In this case, uh, one of the big uh, corporations, IBM, is partnering with DISD to make this happen, and it's all in an effort to bring a pathway to technology and to help those uh, who don't have the resources to do that, to get them into college, to get them taking programs, and get them away from a culture of non-achievement to a culture of, of academics, and to show these kids that they can, they can excel. Outside of that, we've got to raise the minimum wage. It's, it's been $7.25 since 2009. Uh, the, the, we, we've got to reduce wage stagnation. Since 1973, uh, productivity has gone up 73% in this country and uh, wages have gone up 12%. And that is not acceptable and that gap has to be has to be closed but it begins with with education. We fully, we have to fully fund public education and stop this voucher talk of taking resources away from public kids and the kids in the inner cities. And, your, and, and your time's up. While Obamacare substantially increased the number of insured Americans, many Americans remain uninsured and U.S. healthcare costs remain significantly higher than in other industrialized countries. Some Democratic lawmakers have renewed calls in recent months for a single-payer health care system. In your view, is Medicare for all the right solution for the U.S.? If so, why? And if not, why not? And in addition to increasing insurance accessibility, are there any other legislative measures that you believe could improve the functioning and the cost efficiencies of the U.S. health care system? So this will go first to Lillian Salerno. 
This is what I've been working on for 20 years, so I'm happy to talk about it. We have to have a system that identifies the huge problem we have of some of the worst health outcomes because, and we pay 40% more. This is about the what we call medicine's middlemen. It's not about individual physicians doing bad work. The physicians in this area are amazing. We have a disincentive system. We have to rein it in. It's about being able to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies, which is what we tried to do when we passed ACA in 2000. Uh, 10, and it's about being able to have full radical transparency. Radical transparency on what you, what you're getting when you go into the uh, healthcare setting. No other place in our economy are we so blinded where we don't know what things cost. And this is why we're paying 40% more. We've got to fix ACA first. We're not in a position to just go to Medicare for all with the idea of a single-payer system. Doctors want it, public wants it, but we can't do it as a country until we get the costs into something that we can afford. I mean, we can talk about it, but the real problem is transparency and competition. And so when you get your pharmaceutical companies and you only end up with five or six of them in the country, that's not unintentional. We've got to break up some of these monopolies also. This goes next to Brett Schick. One in five Texans has health care, health care, or does not have health care insurance. Um, the United States pays the highest med medical costs on the planet. Our prescription costs are the highest on the planet. We have to fix it. We, we can fix it. The single payer system is the way to go. Lillian said it. We have to fix the ACA first. Uh, we have to restore the individual mandate, which was callously and ridiculously stripped out of the plan, which is ruinous. The direct attempt by the president to sabotage our health care industry is going to put millions out of health care within the next couple of years if that's not reversed. I have ACA. I have Obamacare. And I'm telling you, it's not affordable. It's not. It's got to be fixed. And we can do it with a single-payer system. We can do it with Medicare for All. It's a doable thing. There's $60 billion in fraud in the current Medicare system right now. $60 billion a year, and only $3 billion a year of that is recovered. So we can, we can do this by reducing the fraud. We can also, the administrative cost for private health care insurance is 25%. For Medicare, it's 2%. There is a way for this to happen. It's going to take a difficult transition. We start with ACA, but we also begin with, with, with putting emphasis on primary care physicians and wellness at home, and an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's pretty simple, folks. We have to start thinking. We have to lower Time's up. <laughs> this goes next to Ed Meyer. My father used to always say that he didn't care if he was operating on a child in a North Dallas private hospital, at Parkland County Hospital downtown, or at the teaching hospital in Ogomasha, Nigeria. He was going to treat that child as if it were his own child or grandchild. And I put my dad in my latest TV ads because I wanted to reflect those values that I learned from him. And wouldn't it be amazing if our healthcare system in this country reflected those same values? We have to cover everybody in this country. It is a must, and health care is a right. These are the immediate steps I would take. I would have a Medicare option available for every single person in this country. I would have Medicare and the government negotiate prescription drug prices, which would lower the cost of exorbitant cost of prescription drugs in our country. I would make sure we, radically, we have radical transparency. We have to show all the costs that are going into health care and where that money is going to. Folks don't know how much of your money actually goes into health care and where that goes to. And if we increase transparency, it will help put downward pressure on costs. And finally, we have to have delivery system reform in this country. We're looking decades into the future. The rising cost of health care is unsustainable. We need delivery system reform, and we need to invest in innovation about different uh, payment methods and ways to actually focus on prevention rather than just you know, treating someone down at the Parkland County Hospital, because that's going to be a lot more expensive than working at the outset of the problem. This goes next to Colin Allred. Well, we have a health care crisis in North Texas. One in five uh, Dallas County residents don't have health insurance. One in six Texans don't have health insurance. That's the highest rate in the nation. 
And when we talk about how we get to universal health care, I believe we must get to universal health care, and I believe health care is a right. Uh, the refrain is always about the cost of it and how expensive it will be. And I just want to say we already have universal health care. We just pay for it in a cruel and stupid way. We do it at Parkland. We do it through our property taxes. And we do it when we are seeing people at the, when they're at their worst, when, if they've been able to get access to preventative care, they might have been able to avoid going to the hospital at all. And so I think we have to look at all these decisions through the prism of how much we are already paying because of how many folks in Texas specifically don't have health insurance. And so I support Medicare for All. But Medicare for All is not actually, in my opinion, going to ever be a single-payer system. We will never only have, the government won't take over the hospitals, every doctor will not become an employee of the government. That's not what I believe is the American way to get to universal health care. I believe the American way to get to universal health care is to provide a baseline of care to everyone that can be supplemented, if you uh, so please, uh, with other types of insurance. My mom is on Medicare right now. It helped pay for her breast cancer uh, treatment. Uh, but she also is a retired teacher, so she uses her teacher retirement to cover some of the gaps that Medicare doesn't fill in. And so I would think that we have to provide everyone with that access to Medicare. And I think we do that through uh, whatever you want to call it, whether it's Medicare for all, Medicare Part X, Medicare Part E, with the E being for everybody, I don't care what we call it, but everyone uh, should have a baseline of care. And like I said, we're already paying for that. We're just doing it in an inefficient and cruel way. This goes last to George, I guess. Thank you. I, I spoke earlier about the American, uh, the Affordable Care Act and how important it is to us. And, and my issue with Medicare for all, again, is because it doesn't cover pediatrics, it doesn't cover uh, OBGYN, and the technology just isn't there. Uh, so we have to have this bridge. It has to be the Affordable Care Act. It, it's got us to 91%. We could get to 97%. But we do have to reduce the cost of care. And how we do that is by funding these community clinics. We've got examples of how we can do this. Parkland has done this. Uh, Krista Spawn and Corpus Christi has done this. They've put the clinics in the communities where they most need it, where we have struggling folks who can't drive themselves to the hospital. And the idea is this. Look, it's very simple. If you can provide somebody with a $4 a month prescription for high blood pressure, you're avoiding the cost of a heart attack, of a stroke, and them ending up at Parkland Hospital in a hospital bed. What Parkland has been able to do since 1979 is increase their, 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 um, their care to people by 300%, but they really haven't increased their bed space that much by using this technology. Uh, we need to restore the individual mandate. We need to control meta the cost of big farm by allowing us to import safe pharmaceuticals into this country, by allowing Medicare to negotiate the prices. Uh, and I've got another point here, but I can't even read my own uh, You're out of time. My own notes. Um, You're out of time. Saved by the bell. <laughs> the mass shootings in Newtown, Orlando, Las Vegas, Sutherland Springs, and now Parkland, Florida, as well as the thousands of additional gun deaths that occur in the U.S. each year, have not prompted any meaningful new national gun safety legislation. If anything, efforts have been made to relax gun laws further, most recently with the December House bill that would permit gun owners to carry concealed weapons across state lines. As the national conversation about guns becomes incre increasingly polarized, and the NRA continues to exert an outsized influence on many Republican and some Democratic lawmakers. Are there any legislative gun safety measures that you believe could actually gain bipartisan support? This will go first to Ed Meyer. So I'm the father of two amazing kids, a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old, and I drop them off at a DISD public school every morning. And when I pull out, I, I do this every morning out of the carpool line. I say a little prayer that they'll have a productive and safe day. I cannot even begin to imagine the horror, unthinkable horror, of getting that call or hearing that something's happened at their school. Um, hearing those Florida kids, they're demanding action. We're five years since Sandy Hook. How have we done nothing in this country? If you believe that the status quo on gun violence is acceptable in our country, you do not deserve to be our representative, and I will fight for this in Washington. I believe we can have universal background checks. This is supported by 80, 90% of our country. 
and we can't even get a bill passed on this. We couldn't even get bump stock banned after Las Vegas when everybody said, yeah, we agree, even Republicans were agreeing, but the gun lobby is just pushing back and they own a lot of these representatives. We need universal background checks. We need to close the boyfriend loophole that allows domestic abusers to still have their hands on guns. And we've got to make sure that we are um, keeping guns out of the hands of people that are suffering from mental illnesses. These are three steps that have 80% approval here in Texas and across this country. We can get that done. This goes next to George Rodriguez. Well, I'd like to see assault weapons banned. But I think what we can compromise on and what we can agree on is that we can't have a universal permit, a national permit, with a real background check and biometrics. Uh, I think we have to require folks to have that in order to buy or sell a weapon. That closes the loophole where you don't have to buy through a licensed dealer. I believe that what we need to do is we need to take weapons away from those who have been convicted of violent crimes, including those who are stalkers, uh, folks who are in a dating relationship and those who uh, have committed domestic violence. The other thing too, and I, I didn't realize this until the, uh, the, the Florida event, you know, if you can't vote, you can't buy a gun. That should be the law. How can we sell assault weapons to a teenager? Um, you know, there's, there's so much that we can do in this field, but really it all goes back to campaign finance reform. That's really what we need. I was working for the Obama administration when uh, Sandy Hook happened and I was just at the White House complex, which is not that I was in the White House, I was in the complex. And at that time, we were just so, like everyone in there was just hysterical tears that this could happen on our watch. And there was this idea that in our heads it was, this this was a one one off deal. We, there's no way somebody's going to let this happen again. We proposed legislation. We were already out of the majority, so it's 2012. No matter what we did, and if it had a D on it, as a Democrat, dead on arrival. Nothing that we could do. But I think there might be hope. Those kids in Florida, they're not going to lie down. And we may, if we can get some representatives up there that'll talk to each other. You could get some bipartisanship in this environment. But I think what we could do immediately to take care of maybe a third or a half, I'm not sure of the numbers, I put out a press release on this yesterday, is just like George said, you can't vote, you can't drink, you can't drive. If we just made it so you couldn't get an assault weapon until you were 26 years old, that take care of about a third or a half of the mass killings that we've had. Just that. We ought to be able to agree on that. And I'm just so proud of those kids that asked us to be adults, so let's do that. And adult is not what Pete Sessions is, taking corporate money. This goes next to Colin Ari. Well, the question was, is, is there a legislative bipartisan fix? And the answer is no. The Republicans will not vote to do the right thing. They've shown that time and time and time again. The bodies of first graders weren't enough. We lost more people in Las Vegas than we lost retaking Fallujah. We couldn't even get bump stocks regulated. I am uh, you know, concerned and, and ashamed that this shooting too will fade into the background and nothing will be done. And so the question is whether or not there's something right now that, that a bipartisan fix can be done. No, until we put the equities on the side of doing the right thing. And that means voting out people like Pete Sessions. Mm -hmm. Some of these folks just have to be replaced. Pete Sessions is one of the largest recipients, as we've all said, of funding from the NRA. He is not going to change his mind, no matter how compelling our argument is. The data is all clear. The polling is clear, in fact, which is amazing. Polling among NRA members is actually clear. It doesn't seem to matter. It's not enough because the equities for them are on the side of doing the wrong thing until we vote them out. And then when we vote them out, we have to implement campaign finance reform and get money out of politics. I think we have to have a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. I believe we should have a public financing of campaigns so that, that we will no longer have this corrupting influence of money to preventing our politicians from doing the right thing, the thing they know they need to be doing, but that they won't do because it's not in their interest. This goes last. 
I'm going to vote. I would vote immediately uh, in favor of Senator Cornyn's bipartisan fix the NICS bill. It would. Uh, he proposed it right after uh, Sutherland Springs, and we found out the government wasn't doing proper background checks. Uh, he, that that law would would force the government to follow its current rules on background checks and also eliminate bump stocks. I did a story on bump stocks two days after the shooting in Las Vegas. I went out and bought one for hundred dollars at Cabela's. We put it on, we showed how it worked, and the guy who does, who showed me how to work it uh, is, a, is a, a firearms instructor, and I said, Travis, what is this bump stock? Is it just a toy? He said, yeah, it's just a toy. I happen to think the same thing about AR-15s and these military-style assault weapons. Sure, I'd love to ban them like they do in Connecticut. That's not going to happen. You know why? Uh, anybody in here know Pete Delkus? You know Pete Delkus? Yeah. Weatherman of Channel 8 News, Pete saw my story that night in the studio. He came over to me and he said, Brad, I really don't believe in those bump stocks. I have two AR-15s myself, and you don't need a bump stock. There are too many people who own the AR-15. You're not going to be able to do it. What you can do is eliminate 30-round magazines, eliminate and ban uh, body armor, and universal background checks. And yes, let's reel in the campaign finance mess, too. All right, so now we're going to turn to our final question. Um, for which we are requesting, in this case, um, just a yes or no response from the candidates. Um, if you do not win the primary, will you pledge now to fully support the winner, including by sharing research and donor information, and by participating in efforts to unify Democratic voters behind that candidate? And this will go first to Colin Allred. Yes. Lillian Salerno. Yes. Ed Meyer. Yes. Brett Shipp. Yes. George Rodriguez. Absolutely. Friday, March 2nd. Go vote. Thank you.